Welcome everybody to our final webinar in the Navigating Drought series. Before we get started, I'd just like to cover some housekeeping. Uh, if you have questions throughout the uh, webinar, please submit those through the Q&A or chat, and uh, we'll be sure to catch those and address them at the end of the webinar. And I think uh, this will be uh, recorded for, for uh, viewing later on and posted through our YouTube site. With that, I think we'll just start with some introductions. First off, I'm Zach Carlson. I'm the Extension Beef Cattle Specialist uh, located out of Fargo. I'm Carl Hoppy. I'm the Extension Livestock Specialist here at the Carrington Research Extension Center. I look forward to visiting with you today. Our uh, next introduction would be Jana. Hi, Jana Block, Livestock Specialist based out of the Hedinger REC. This is Jerry Stucka. Um, I'm the Extension Veterinarian and Livestock Stewardship person here, um, housed on campus in Fargo. Thank you. So today's discussion is going to be a bit different than from previous uh, webinar, uh, the Navigating Drought series. Um, we're more focused today on kind of looking at winter, uh, wintering your cow herd and kind of maybe some health concerns associated with that. And then maybe some of the conditions that the drought has caused with your livestock production systems and how we may need to address those here this coming winter. So with that, um, uh, and then of course, any questions that you may have and, and then gearing towards um, calving season as we know that's right around the corner. So thank you for all those that submitted questions and the registration. And if you have any, again, feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A and we'll address those. And I think we'll get started. Thank you, Zach. Our uh, first speaker is going to be Jana, and I'm going to ask Jana a question. So Jana, many of our operations had reduced hay production this year across the state. It's been a horrible drought and just not having enough hay. Some producers have salvaged crops for feed or sourced low-quality forages, like uh, some of our CRP hays or, or even corn stover, that type of thing. What, what do you think producers need to think about when it comes to feeding these alternative sources? Well, I think we just, can you hear me okay? Yes. Good, okay. I think we need to be um, really honest with ourselves about what we have in terms of diet quality. Um, there's obviously a lot of consequences when we are thinking about feeding some lower quality forages. And, you know, again, like you mentioned, a lot of people, I mean, if they were lucky, they got some CRP hay or salvaged some forage from somewhere, but we might not have the, alfalfa grass mix that we might count on on a normal year and things like that. So um, we need to make sure that we've got appropriate supplementation when we're using those lower quality forages to avoid, you know, negative consequences on uh, pregnant cows losing body condition, um, and then consequences on our cat, you know, next year's calf crop. And so, you know, when cows are in poor condition, we're going to have issues um, with colostrum quality, colostrum production, milk production, um, immune response of the calves. There's lots of things that kind of carry through. And so, um, you know, we're, we're obviously facing a protein and energy shortage in many conditions. And then we also have to think about vitamins and minerals potentially being deficient, um, even more deficient than they would be in a normal year. And so making, the, making sure those things are supplied. So the only way that you can really know exactly what you've got is to sample and submit that sample to a lab, a certified lab for analysis. So we'll just kind of talk through, um, you should see some slides on your screen and I just wanna talk through a couple of these briefly. Um, the best way to sample is to use a hay probe. Um, a hand sample is not adequate. So in the graph on the right, it's a little bit, kind of confusing to read, but essentially the grab samples are in the yellow bar on the top um, compared to 20 core samples in the blue bar on the bottom. And so basically the grab samples are underrepresenting the quality of the forage. And that's simply because you're likely just grabbing a lot of stem and not representing the amount of leaves that are in that sample. And so the hay probe is the best way to, to collect the sample. Um, many of our extension offices have a hay probe that you can borrow. Um, if you'd like to get your own, then you would have it on hand for future sampling because it's not only a drought year where this is important, it's every single year um, understanding what your forage is supplying to your cow herd. 
So kind of the rule of thumb is about 10% of each lot of hay. And a lot is defined as the same species taken off the same field in a 48 hour period. Um, obviously you have a larger lot of hay. Um, you don't have to collect a full 10%. Um, say you have six or 700 bales, you would not need to collect 10%. Just get at least 20 core samples and, and composite those um, to send into the lab. Um, if you are looking for your own hay probe, I just have some recommendations down here. The National Forage Testing Association has a website and I'll show you the link to that website here in a couple slides where they also have some recommendations on different hay probes and what to look for. Um, I would definitely recommend a drill type. You do not want to be pushing a hay probe into bales. A lot of times the um, density is up pretty high and it's really hard to get those push types in. So get a drill type, bring lots of extra batteries um, and that's the way to go. Uh, anything less than three eighths in diameter, I would not recommend because it simply leaves out um, the stems and overrepresents the leaves. And so that three quarter inch diameter is really kind of the best way to go. Um, 12 to 24 inches in length, going any further than that really isn't necessary because at 24 inches, um, you're going to be representing the majority of each bale. Um, and just making sure that you've got a really sharp tip regardless if that tip is serrated or non-serrated. So just a kind of a image here from the Noble Foundation that just shows um, why the length of the probe is important. And so in that outer six inches, around 33%, 26% um, of the bale in that next six inches and so on. And so um, if we've got an 18 inch probe, we are representing right around 80% of the bale. If you went to a 24, you'd be almost representing over 90% of the bale. So just depending on your preferences there, but that's kind of how density stacks up. So our recommendation, get those 20 core samples. Um, it's, it's much handier if you can just put them in a five gallon bucket um, you know, take your probe, um, dump it into the bucket, and then just mix that and fill a quart size, or you can send in a gallon bag um, with a forage. You should end up with around half a pound to one pound of a sample. Um, depending on the moisture content of your forage, um, if it's just, if, if the hay has already gone through a sweat and, and it's kind of just dry hay, um, probably refrigeration isn't necessary, but we do recommend sampling close to the time of shipping, just to make sure that we're not having um, changes in, in that forage in the bag as far as moisture content. Um, and then many people have used laboratories in the past and they might have a lab they're, they're used to working with. If you're not sure, um, I would recommend just choosing a lab that's been certified through the National Forage Testing Association. And that is their website there. You can click on certification and then click on list of NFTA certified laboratories and each laboratory will have a grade as far as either a wet chemistry analysis or the near infrared analysis um, types of evaluation. And so you can look at the labs and how they performed in their certification procedure and choose a lab that you're comfortable with. Um, many of them have prices listed on their website, but sometimes you have to contact them to get those updated prices. Um, also, many times you can just check with your extension agent and see what lab they prefer to use and, and go with that. So I guess I would just kind of wrap up by saying, um, once you have those analyses, we can really have more efficient use of our forages by looking at the requirements of our livestock based on stage of production, weight, um, and kind of try to allocate our different forage lots um, with these different production groups. And so you can see here, obviously our gestating cow that's in about mid gestation can get by with some fairly low quality roughage. And honestly, this is what a lot of our forage is looking like. I know for myself on our operation, we, we um, harvested a lot of CRP hay that had, that had been in the program and came out of the program last fall. And so uh, we were able to harvest it fairly early. It looked really good. It had green, it smelled good, but there was a lot of old dead stuff. And when we got our hay analysis results back, we're looking at right around 7% crude protein and around that 50 to 53% TDN. 
And so that's going to be fine for us in mid gestation, but it's obviously not going to meet requirements as that calf continues to grow in the third trimester, and then obviously really going to be deficient for that lactating cow, um, especially when she reaches peak lactation at around 60 days post calving. So we also have to think about if we've got replacement heifers on hand, um, heifer calves, uh, you know, maybe we've kept some calves around and, we, and we're trying to wean them, get them ready to sell. Um, everybody's just gonna have a little different requirements. And so understanding the nutrient value of each of your lots of forage is really gonna help you use that forage the most efficient way that you can and supplement appropriately. Thanks, Jana. That was uh, uh, very informative on the nutrient requirements uh, for, for our cattle and knowing just what we have and what we need. Um, are, are there other things that we can look at in our, that we should have tested with in our uh, forages for nutrient content? And I'm thinking along the lines of nitrates. Could you talk on that? Yeah, we definitely had um, a lot of people that are harvesting annual forages. And so with most of our annual forages, um, you know, this can be a potential risk. Um, our, our oat forages, um, any of the small grains, um, corn, um, a lot of people were in a grazing situation. So we were recommending testing prior to grazing. Um, and we do have a nitrate toxicity publication that's available on our website that, um, you know, that, that producer would need to analyze their forage for nitrates. That's a separate test from the forage quality test, but it's usually relatively inexpensive, anywhere from 10 to $12 um, for the most part. Excuse me, my phone's ringing there in the background. <laughs> um, so you can use that publication to determine how much of that forage you can include in the ration and, and mix that off with forages that are non-nitrate containing. Um, some other things that you might want to think about evaluating is mineral content, especially this year. Um, drought can drastically change the mineral content of the forages, which I mentioned earlier. And so getting a wet chemistry analysis for minerals is, is probably a good idea and making sure that, that your supplement is meeting those needs. The other thing that we might see, um, I did notice in some of our samples that I submitted, the ash content was a little bit higher this year, probably just due to soil contamination. And so if that's extremely high, um, somewhere in that neighborhood of 12 to 13%, um, that could potentially, you know, those cows are going to be consuming quite a bit of soil with their forage, and that can actually drive down the energy content of the forage. So it's just a good idea to take a look at that. If you need help interpreting your forage analysis, contact your extension agent or one of the specialists to help you work through that. So there are just a couple other considerations um, when it comes to evaluating the quality of the forage. Jan, I'd like to provide a follow-up question to you. Sure. And that is, um, over the summer, people have tested some of their feeds that are still out in the field and the nitrates are quite high. But recently we've had some rains and they've gone out and retested them and the nitrate level is quite low now. Is, is, is that a good reason to keep testing or what are your thoughts about that? Do things happen that fast? Yeah, I mean, so kind of the, the general idea is if moisture is available, that plant is going to, you know, the metabolism is going to pick up, whereas it's been pretty stagnant throughout the, the growing season. So essentially what should happen is that plant will be better able to utilize the nitrate that's present and convert that more efficiently to amino acids and protein. Unfortunately, there's no formula that's going to tell us how efficient that is in different situations, just based on differences in soil types, um, plant species, and all those other fertilization and all those other factors that, that drive those differences to begin with. So testing is really, truly the only way to know if you're going to have an issue or not. Um, we can't really say, oh, it's, you know, we received this much, mo this much moisture and now we should be out of the danger zone because it's still entirely possible to have high nitrates in some situations while others may not. Test and test again, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, <clears throat> Thanks, Jana. So Carl, kind of along those lines, um, Jana mentioned feeding, you know, maybe that hay looks good, but it might not test good. So we're dealing maybe with some lower quality forages, maybe sourcing some crop residues and things like that. What are some concentrate feeds or maybe some off 
farm sources of feeds that producers can find here in North Dakota and uh, might be available this year, or at least uh, kind of search out and, and seek those sources. And uh, yeah, are there, uh, are there any resources, you know, for pricing and trying to find those? Thanks, Zach. Yeah, uh, we're, we're, we're actually pretty lucky in North Dakota. When you go to other beef cow states, they don't have the amount of, the amount of milling capabilities that we have in North Dakota. And we have a wide variety of, of feeds available to mix in with our cow herd. A lot of these feeds are uh, processed grains. Um, we can use grains, of course, as a concentrate source, whether it be corn, barley, or milo, or wheat, or um, bit oats, wh whatever pencils in cheap, and that certainly does fit into your ration. But we have other sources out here too, uh, things like ethanol byproducts, like distillers grains, uh, wheat middlings that come out of wheat mill plants. Uh, if you need protein, it can come out of our oil crush plants uh, across the state. Um, sugar as sugar byproducts, the beet pulp and the tailings are available as well as potato waste from potatoes. We have a lot of different feed resources and most of these have the sugar removed from them. So they're not much good in our monogastric industry, but when it comes to our beef cattle and the ability for them to ferment fiber and make that into digestible feed, um, we have a, a lot of feed available for us in North Dakota. And so you've seen the map out, out on your screen right now. And if you look close, you'll see a lot of our production is concentrated in the Red River Valley area. Um, that would be because of that's the sugar beets and the potatoes and the crushes and the mills are located up there as well. Uh, we even have a high fructose uh, corn uh, refining plant down at Wapaton, North Dakota. So there's even, even more capabilities on the eastern part of the state than there is on the western side. If you look across though, you see those yellow dots, which are ethanol plants that are producing ethanol. Um, they also produce distillage grains, both dried and modified distillage grains, modified being about 50% moisture. And some of the plants produce a wet product, which is more like 60% moisture. Um, sometimes they'll produce a corn syrup. That's what they call it. It's really condenses still your solubles. And uh, it has about the same feed value as the dried or wet distillage grains on a dry matter basis. As you can see, as you start drifting out to the Western part of the state, the opportunities for these different co-products are a little bit farther and fewer between. And demand consequently has increased in those areas too. So since demand is up, uh, price is up also, and it's difficult, it becomes a, a game. You either pay for freight or you pay for a local higher local pr price. So anyway, uh, we talk to your local extension agent and they will have a price, uh, a price sheet as well as a uh, directory of uh, with phone numbers of who to contact in the state if you're looking for these co-products out of these plants. Um, prices uh, change hourly. So even though you might see a price, you always need to call the plant and find out what the plant's available. I was just visiting with one of the plants earlier this week and uh, they needed to get rid of some product right now and their price is about 50% to two thirds what normal price was because they needed to move it this week. A semi, uh, train cars hadn't showed up in time. So consequently, they're just having a production issue. So my point is, be sure to, if you can utilize some of these feeds, by all means, please contact the plants to find out where to, what's available and where to get them. Another point is most of these co-products have removed about two thirds of their starch, which, oh, excuse me, they removed the starch was about two thirds of the product. So in other words, everything else in the co-product has tripled. So the phosphorus is higher. The protein is higher. They're nice protein feeds, but when you look at, they don't have starch, but all the other things are higher. When you start looking at different uh, balancing rations, you need to consider that some of the minerals are higher in those too. Well, uh, okay. So if we think about, Jana had a nice table um, outlining maybe where requirements are right now for a spring calving herd, and maybe we can meet those with some lower quality forages. Um, but what do producers need to think about or start considering when incorporating these concentrates of grains into that, into a cow's diet? Well, the, the first thing is always cost, right? Where it's always an issue. How much can we spend to feed a cow? I had a producer call me the other day asking about, so um, I, my banker and I were looking at three and a half dollars a head to feed a cow this winter. Is that right? And when you start doing the math and yardage, those numbers get pretty high. And if uh, you look at the price of corn this year, it's double compared to last year. So all of a sudden, 
money is a big deal. The cost of these feeds is a really huge deal. So the only way to really compare different feeds and the value of them is on their energy content. And uh, this particular graph shows up here. Uh, we've got both um, two different feedstuffs. One is corn, which is a constant grain, easy to haul between locations. Another one we used as an example is brome hay, which is just a long stem hay. It's really easy to feed cows brome hay. It's a little more of a challenge to feed them corn. It should probably be processed and feed in a feed bunk or in a totally mixed ration, but let's just figure out which one's a cheaper buy. Um, dry matter content's about the same, 85% dry or 15% moisture. Cost per pound of dry matter, if you do the math, you take the 230 per ton for the corn and divide that by um, the 85% dry matter or 0.85 and then divide that by 2000, you'll end up a cost per pound, which is on this example, 0.136. You can do the same thing with brome hay. Now, there's the differences between these two feeds and that is the total digestible nutrients or what I call the energy content of the feed uh, corn is what we call 90%, and brome hay is quite a bit less because it's a fiber source feed, so it's at 53%. Well, you do the math again, you take that cost per pound of nutrient, excuse me, cost per pound of dry matter, that 0.136, and divide it by the uh, TDN content, which is 0.9, you'll end up with that 0.15%, which is the cost of energy for corn. Okay, you compare, do the same thing for the brome hay, and you find out the brome hay is 0.166. So actually for a few pennies cheaper, you can buy the corn. Now freight's included, so you gotta add freight into the corn price. And the other thing is that I noticed, I, even though I use this price at 150 a ton, um, if you try to go out and buy round bales for um, 75 or $80 a ton, all of a sudden, uh, excuse me, 70, $85 a bale, that you may not find it. You might have to pay $100 a bale or even more. So do your math again, you might find out that that grain is actually a cheaper source of energy for our cow herd than what the hay is. Excellent. Um, yeah, so we kind of touched on requirements and things like that and how they may change. Can you allude a little bit more to that? Oh yeah, we uh, talk about protein. Cows need protein. Now usually people, every, everybody always talk about protein needs. We need to have a certain level of protein on our feeds. And then we talk about protein. They need energy too. That's why the first example is talking all about energy. But we need protein in our feeds and we need to have enough protein to maintain the microbes in the rumen so they can digest the feed that the cattle can then utilize. And the protein requirements for the cow changes throughout her stage of production. So when they're lactating, her protein uh, requirements are quite high. And as she gets lactation decreases, and then when she's get weaned, you can see in this map, uh, when she's weaned, that's when the protein content drops the most. And then as the fetus grows, the protein content increases in the ration. But you can see there's that over the year, certain times a year, you can skimp on protein and other times you need to have more. The same thing actually happens in uh, energy. If we can go to the next slide. You know, if you look at energy, the same thing. It says in mid and mid gestation or right after weaning, that's when the energy requirement for the cow is the lowest. I used to always say, yeah, that's the best time to cheapen up a cow ration. Right then is when that energy requirement is the lowest. And I've changed that opinion now because when you're out there and looking at cows and their body condition score, and you might talk about that later, you find out that... Uh, these cows uh, really, really are not in very good condition and they need to have some gains. So that particular time of the year, mid gestation is a perfect time, but wait on to a cow. So consider where you're at and where your cows are at and know that there's certain times, if you understand this production cycle, when it's best to plot what you're doing. So now I have to ask you, you Zach, I kind of led into the body condition <laughs> score, but could you tell a little, bit of, a little bit more about body condition score and how that fits in to our cow herd? This time of year is a perfect time to capture a score as to where we are right at weaning. So maybe some people have weaned and maybe in, some are looking to do so in November and December. And um, one condition score doesn't tell you much. You need a direction in terms of where your herd is moving. So if you're able to capture some of those subjective scores over the summer, or if this is a new concept to you, uh, really what you want to be doing is, is monitoring where your herd is moving. So a snapshot as, at just weaning doesn't tell you too much about where those cows have come from and where they're headed into. You need some direction towards that. So 
Uh, again, we, there are materials that we provide or have available through extension for scoring. And it is something that I would encourage you if you're new to it, or if it's a newer concept, since it is, takes a lot of repetition in order to get quite familiar with the system, you do it with a, a, a buddy system and, mm. and kind of, and use that to kind of calibrate yourself as you work through. But there is a lot of value in, in adjusting these scores because body condition is often thought of as, as the amount of fat that a cow is carrying, but there's also body condition evaluates a little bit of muscling. And we know mm -hmm. both are utilized when, uh, for uh, reserves when that animal needs to in a situation where they're not, uh, intake isn't great enough to, to meet those maintenance or lactation requirements. And so I really think though, as we think about um, body condition right now and where we're headed, and, and you, you alluded to it greatly, uh, Carl, that, uh, when we look at those that post calving six, seven months, we're in that mid gestation. So now we know as soon as we wean, we know we're going to come into the lowest energy and lowest protein requirements that that cow will carry. Mind you, that doesn't apply to your first calf heifers or your three-year-olds. And so keep that in mind as that will change. Those cows are still growing. Those females are still growing and have a growing requirement. They're not quite at full maintenance yet, but um, as we, as we think about where your cows are here at weaning, I kind of think of if you're having a hard time sourcing some of these commodities, some of these concentrates, and, and you really want to stretch, um, uh, your hay inventory as much as you possibly can. Uh, one thing to consider if you're not looking at weaning for another month or so is actually, you could, you could almost consider it. I often do that early weaning could be a, a supplementation. Now we're not really into early weaning, but if you're still looking at keeping those calves on the cows for another month or so, you may wanna evaluate where your cow's condition are. And certainly if you feel like you can carry yourself through that to that normal weaning period that you do, um, by all means. But I would encourage you to take a look at considering weaning um, a little early if, if, if you tend to wean later here in the, in the fall, is almost like a supplementation. You almost, you can start that lowest requirements right now by, by getting into some weaning or doing weaning now. And so, uh, but if you have already weaned, it's, it's, it's again, a good place to evaluate where you are as you head into calving, because one of the most important things uh, that we have to think about is cow's condition at calving and how that may actually affect milk quality. And by that, what I mean is actually, if you look at the influence of body condition scores on both colostrum quality. So right now that top table that you're looking at, as you look from a body condition three, which we just saw was kind of, is, is quite thin on the condition side of things, moving all the way over to six in that table. What, what those, what that calf serum IgM and IgG what those really are is plasma proteins that the calf is able to uh, consume through milk consumption. Actually, colostrum uh, is really where those are coming from, colostrum. And that's actually what starts uh, and, and protects that calf's immunity system as it uh, develops at such an early age. And, uh, and so if we consider body condition score and how that might impact, there's great data. Kenodia has good data and many more too have shown that lower body condition scores means you're just not, that the protein isn't being carried through into the milk, which then isn't transferred to the calf. And so we have to kind of think too, that uh, not only are you thinking about the, the calf that will be coming this spring, but also you have to think about that cow in the calf following year. So you're, you got to look at this kind of in two separate directions as one is to protect the current calf and one is to guarantee or better uh, gear your cow towards uh, reproducing it once again for next year. And so it's really important that bottom graph there shows that when cows condition, if you, if you consider that three and four score being quite thin and moderate being five or six, if you look there at uh, the percent of cows that came back into heat post post calving now and uh and and that interval between um her first heat cycle after calving it's really important to understand that um there's a lot of uh signals going on in a, in a cow's body and one of those is if she can support reproduction at that point and so understanding that again kind of going back to 
where you are right now with your cow herd as you start looking into calving and, and being prepared. And, and so now's the best time to be putting on condition. If you realize, uh, if you take a look at your herd tomorrow or later today and you realize, geez, maybe these cows are a little under condition, now's the best time uh, to make most use of those feeds that you may have to bring in. They're going to be expensive, but it's much harder once she has more energy and protein requirements to put on condition than it is right now at her lowest. And so you, I, I think I encourage everyone, you have to know the direction that your animals are headed in order to uh, properly evaluate. And also um, there's certainly thin cows that every producer probably has or heavy set cows that do find every single year. And so this is by all means, you have to understand the, the condition that your cows are in, in in normal situations and how you manage those cows uh, to the best of their abilities, but how that might've been changed this year due to that lack of forage production and, and then forage quality as we, as we move into the winter. Yeah, thank you, Zach. As I drive up and down the roads and uh, look at different cow herds from afar, you can say that some are in decent condition and others have slip condition over the summer because of lack of groceries or the environment. Well, uh, definitely shows that um, if you don't feed them well enough, you might end up with some open cows next spring. So it's a health issue now. So thanks for talking about the nutritional part of this. Jerry, uh, Dr. Stuck is on our line, our extension veterinarian. And uh, Jerry, could you talk to us on what producers would need to keep on top of uh, our cow health? Uh, as we move from weeding to calving, what needs to be done? What should we look yeah. for? Yeah, thanks, Carl. I just want to back up to a couple of comments that have been made already. And one is body condition score. I was at a ranch a number of years ago in South Dakota, and 800 cows. And as we went through the herd and looked at them, there, there, I made the assessment there was probably 20% that were thin, too thin. So what do you do? There was plenty of feed on hand. Do you feed everybody? Uh, to uh, make up for the 20% that's behind or do you sort them off? So it becomes a, a little bit of a management issue. You're better off, if possible, to sort them off and feed them separately. And so that's the part of the reason why we want to condition score cows. We don't care so much what each cow is in in terms of condition, but if you got some that are too thin, and just like Zach was saying, it can have an impact on not only quality, of colostrum, but also certainly quantity. The other thing I'd, I'd mentioned too, and Carl, you alluded to it, that you used to be kind of a guy that wanted to cheapen up that ration during, during gestation. Second's okay, but third trimester gestation, which are some cows even in third trimester now, we know that this fertile programming becomes an issue if we start trying to short energy and or protein. It has an impact on that developing calf that may uh, last with that animal a long time. So a lot of important issues that, you know, it we kind of gloss over them somewhat superficially, but they're very important. Um, these are stewardship issues that we need to pay attention to. So I just threw this picture in here of a cow that's, uh, this, in fact, this she might've still had her calf on her and it's a good little thing to talk about what condition score is she in, right? I mean, she's probably still a good five anyway, which is a good thing to see, even with a calf on her in late fall, early winter. So I just want to move to the next slide. I got a couple of comments I wanted to make regarding health, and they're kind of a follow-up to what Zach was talking about. We talk about colostrum quality. We talk about colostrum quantity, how much a cow milks. But I, one of my favorite things to talk about is the, is, is the plumbing. Does the plumbing work or doesn't it? And I think we've gotten much better at this over the years in assessing udder confirmation and teat, teat confirmation. It's, it's one thing to birth a calf, but can the calf get up and nurse and, and actually consume and absorb the amount of immunity that it needs to to stay healthy? And, and the other thing that enters into this is calving season. Um, when we calve when it's cold, when we calve when it's muddy, that calf's ability to get all the immunity that it needs, it can be limited. A number of years ago, I came across a data set that measured the uh, gamma globulins, immunoglobulins in calves that were born. 
And on these ranches, five different ranches, approximately anywhere from 15 to 30 percent of those calves that were born didn't quite have enough didn't quite have enough immunity in their system, which goes back to the things that we're talking about here. So this is a really, really important issue. So here in this slide, I've just got some images of water quality. Go ahead. The other thing, I'm maybe jumping the gun here a little bit too, um, talking about not only health um, of the cow, but getting into the health of the calf. And if I'm getting too far ahead of myself, I can wait with this slide. But so we're not only concerned this time of the year with preparing a cow uh, and preparing that calf for weaning, but we're also thinking about preparing that calf that's yet to be born. And so what happens with a cow that's in late gestation is that we start having, depending on when she's going to calf, approximately five to six weeks before she's going to calf, she starts taking immunity off her own, out of her own bloodstream, so to speak, and, and concentrates it in the colostrum. So we can start talking about things like scours vaccination, for example. So when should I scours vaccinate? We used to be really strict and want to go maybe six weeks for the first dose and then three weeks later, give it a booster dose. And we all know what booster doses do. They enhance the immune response to the first dose. And the idea was in first calf heifers to make sure we got a big antibody response. So that antibody that then gets concentrated in the colostrum and, and calf gets up and nurses and he's good to go. More recently, there have been a number of products that have come to market that maybe say it's 10, 12 weeks away from, from calving. I won't say that they're the best, but they're probably better than nothing if you've chosen to use a calf scours vaccine. One of the more recent things that I've noticed with trying to manage calf scours, so is changing your calving season. When you change calving season, you move it to a later time, you don't have cows concentrated in one spot, the need for calf scours vaccines almost disappears entirely. So a couple of things to think about. The timing, what it does for that cow, how it concentrates, the calf gets up and nurses and gets what it needs. And the other thing is if you're continually disappointed with some of these diseases in these calves that are born during inclement weather, think about changing your calving season. So I guess maybe I'll stop there, Zach, in case, unless you want me to talk about wean calves and wean calf health. We can get there in just a minute, I think. Okay. Meanwhile, I'd like to ask Zach, we're still talking a little bit about nutrition. Could you, uh, some producers are looking at corn harvest is, is wrapping up and there's a lot of feed sitting out there. It hasn't snowed yet. So is there an opportunity for these cows to use this? And if, since there is, what do we got to be careful of? Or what do we need to watch? Yeah. Um, so if people are interested or thinking about, you know, this year maybe is really ideal for those considering grazing corn residue. So Following up harvest, we've actually had a great fall for it. Um, we have had great weather. And, and as we know, if you're looking at a spring calving herd in that March to April or even later, uh, we're in that mid gestation point. And so corn residue, if we think about what it really is, there's about 40 pounds of residue per bushel. And that residue is primarily, as you might imagine, the stock. Well, that's not exactly what cows consume. Uh, if they, as long as they're not forced to consume. And we don't really want that because the higher digestibility portions are actually the leaf and husk. And so when we think about grazing residue, that's about 20% um, of, the, of the residue that's out there. So we're somewhere between 40 to 50% uh, total residue per bushel, about 16 pounds or so you can think dry matter basis would be um, that leaf and husk. So that edible portion. And so ultimately, um, when you're thinking about this and looking at it, a great way to consider this, uh, especially, like I said, if, if you're really limited on your availability of forage resources, and you're thinking about this, we've had ideal weather for it, maybe start with a small group or a, a nearby area, somewhere close to home that you could bring those animals back in. Because one of those things we always have to caution with grazing is the weather, right? And weather mm -hmm. can change on you. And, and can put you in a really tough situation. So if you're thinking about this or you have been for a while, this year's a great year to do it. The weather's been great. Uh, think about somewhere nearby, maybe, maybe a neighbor that 
that has a field and, and you could work out an agreement with. In a, a common way, or if you're planning to do some of this, uh, simply think of 100 um, bushels is about one cow month grazing, if you want to think of it that way. So for every 100 bushels of yield, uh, and so you can figure out how much that was per acre, um, even you know in this tough year, and kind of figure out how many acres you might need. There's, there's, there's great resources online, too, to, to find a, um, a calculator for that, but about 100 bushels per cow. And so, but it's important to note here that we should really be looking at if you don't want to do much supplementation other than a mineral program, that it's a, it's a cow that has uh, weaned its calf. So we're at that lowest requirement because we know corn residue is only going to bring seven or 8% crude protein, which will meet that need in mid gestation, but the energy will be low as well. It'll be around that 50% TDN if we think that. So we need to be in that mid gestation and that's the ideal time to graze residue and, and we have good weather for it. If there's situations where you think there may be a lot of corn in that field, um, you have to caution that. We always uh, suggest whenever you're turning animals out to any grazing situation that they're not hungry, you fill them up days before on a feed that you have on a, on a hay or, or whatever they're currently on and you make sure they're not hungry. And then a, a quick way to do this is to go out into the field and walk down a row a hundred feet and start counting the number of, of ears that you see on the ground. So if it's an eight inch ear, um, which this year, maybe they probably wouldn't be so large, but around eight inches, it's a full cob. Then that will eat with grain on it. That will equal close to half a pound of, of grain. And so as you walk, you um, go down a hundred feet, come back a hundred feet in a different row and then go back up. So three rows at hundred feet. And, and, uh, and then, so count the numbers that you see within those spaces between those. And so if it's a 30 inch row, then basically what you do is the number of full ears that you see and divide that by two. And I say that because as I said, a full eight inch ear would be about half a pound. So uh, it'd take 112 of those ears to make 56 pounds a bushel. Mm -hmm. And so that will give you an idea of how many bushels might be dropped there. So you don't have to do those rows right next to each other, um, space them out, you know, to try to at least represent the field. And if you're looking at somewhere between eight to 10 bushels dropped, once you've done this uh, visual assessment, you want to a couple days prior, maybe a week or so, if you're real worried about dropped corn, start stepping those cows up on a little bit of corn. Corn's not cheap right now, but, but really um, it would just start with a pound. And then just go up a pound every single day and do that for seven days uh, or so. And uh, those cows will be adapted to that. And so, because we do know if cows have grazed it in the past, they'll seek that corn out right away. And so uh, that is something to be mindful of is, is how much actual grain corn there is down there. But then use the husk as a measurement of when you're ready to pull those cows off. So you, you have an uh, idea of how long they should last, but keep in mind of the husk. And once you start uh, not seeing husk very often in that field, it's soon time to think about where they're headed to next. Thank you, Zach. Jana. Hey, Carl. Carl, yeah. can I make a, a follow-up? By the way, uh, Zach, thanks for that little formula. This, this question came to me just yesterday. So thank you very much. The other thing I, I just mentioned too, and I know in big cornfields, it's hard to know, walk over every square inch, but, but always be on the lookout for corn that's been spilled during harvest. Um, that will kill cows in a hurry if there's any amount of corn laying in one spot. You almost have to go out there with a shovel and get rid of it, take it someplace else because they'll find it and eat too much grain. That, yep, ec excellent point. Wherever that flex auger missed, yep, be mindful of those areas. I'm glad you brought that comment up, Jerry. I was watching somebody the other day unload into a semi and where they couldn't see it was spilling out of the side of the semi. So they yep. didn't realize they were losing bushels on the ground. I'm sure they yep. didn't want to, but they didn't realize it. And you as a cattle guy are going to, those cows are going to find that problem. The same thing goes with fertilizer. If they're spreading dry fertilizer this time of year. If it's urea, yep. uh, they need to make sure there's no spoil piles that cows go out and graze. And then, uh, you have a toxicity because of it. That can be a real deal. So with that, I'd like to ask Jana a question. We've been talking about grazing crop residues, mostly corn, but uh, are there other ways a producer might consider to stretch their hay further? 
Yeah. So I guess, you know, to go back to what I talked about earlier, um, the value of, of understanding the nutrient content provided by your forage can't be understated here. Um, as far as knowing what you're providing, because if you don't, if you're, it's, you're playing the guessing game, you're either over or under feeding. And so this year in particular, when we have, we don't have a, a lot of extra hay supplies, it's really important that we're, um, making that hay go as far as we can. So some other areas that you might want to evaluate in your operation is thinking about ways to reduce hay waste. Um, there's some really good research out of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, they have a, a website that's dedicated to forage production and forage use. Um, they have some good research evaluating storage losses, feeding losses. Um, so I guess thinking about how is our hay stored um, from harvest, you know, throughout the winter feeding period, and even some some old hay that might have been carried over from last year, um, is it uncovered? Is it, you know, sitting directly on the ground, and and that will result in wicking up moisture um, through the hay, which can result in dry matter losses. And so, thinking about finding ways to cover that stack, or obviously, too late for this year, most of the hay is in. Um, there might be some still out in the field, but people are working on that. So if there's a way to elevate that off the ground, whether using your, you know, rock or railroad ties or pallets, um, whatever that happens to be, that will really cut down those, those dry matter losses. And so just evaluating our storage and what we're doing there. Um, other losses will also occur through feeding. Um, we've all seen it. And I don't know how how much people are actually accounting for that, but it's it's really important to think about how we're feeding um, can impact how much hay is lost. And so um, estimated losses for just rolling out round bales on the ground is around 12%, and that's in an ideal situation. If you're putting out multiple days of round bales and feeding on the ground, it can be up to 30 to 40% loss just through um, the cattle walking on the feed, laying in it, defecating on it. Um, so th those are some huge losses that a lot of times aren't really accounted for. Um, and so thinking about using some type of a barrier to reduce waste, even if you're feeding on the ground, um, putting up some panels, um, even an electric fence, if you can make that work in your feeding situation, bunks, tire feeders, something to um, just avoid the ability of those cows to kind of walk through and trample um, and waste that hay. Um, grinding or processing is, is another way to increase utilization. Of course, they're still going to walk through it, um, but they will get better use out of those low quality forages. We just have to look at the additional costs with that. Um, Dr. Stucka talked about sorting and feeding by production groups. That's a common recommendation, obviously not you know, available in every single situation. You just might ha not have enough pastures or pens to do that, but it is something to think about doing um, if that's an option for you. Um, Carl, you also talked about, you know, thinking about maybe doing a little bit of limit feeding or, or utilizing some corn or other concentrates in the ration. Um, again, just looking at what you're trying to um, provide to those cows, what nutrient you're short of, and just making the most efficient choice there, um, looking at that cost per pound of nutrient basis. I guess one more thing I would add that we don't often think about in relation to our beef cow herds is the use of an ionophore. And that's just basically, um, it, it will help make the cow more efficient by reducing those gram negative bacteria in the rumen that produce methane. And so our byproducts are, those byproducts, the gas, production is reduced, um, the cow is just able to more efficiently utilize the forages. And typically, um, we'll see cows able to reduce their hay intake by 7 to 10%, kind of based on the research, and still maintain body condition because they're just more efficient. And so that can be provided um, in a commercial feed. It can be provided in a mineral mixture. Um, there's lots of ways to, to get that done in your cow herd. And so um, it's often a very cost-effective way to help those cattle utilize forages more efficiently. Thank you, Jan, I appreciate that. Now I'm gonna uh, let it go over to Zach now to ask the next question if you would. Yeah, Thank you. Uh, Jerry, we're ready for you to start talking about wean calf health and, and things along those lines. So what should we be worried about post weaning with these calves, if we're gonna, you know, producers are gonna hold on to them for a little bit before they 
they leave the operation. Yeah, thanks, Zach. So let me follow up one thing that Jana mentioned about feeding ionophores to cows. In this case, it'd be primarily rumensin, but one of the advantages of doing that is that you, uh, you actually end up having fewer coccidia organisms in the feeding grounds. One of the things that we face, I know it's a little bit off topic, but whether it's in springtime, springborn calves, or even calves coming into the, to the lot or grass trap um, is coccidiosis. And so sometimes we'll, we'll utilize coccidiostats, whether Decox or Bov Bovitec or Remensen or, or different programs to remove the risk of, of uh, coccidiosis. And so one of the th benefits of feeding ionophores like Hermensen during the winter time, is not only are the cows more efficient, but you reduce the shedding of oocysts into the environment. So just in a kind of an aside from what Jana was talking about. What I wanted to mention here is not necessarily a plug for any program per se, but it's maybe more of a stewardship issue. I know that there's a lot of cows, calves that are shipped right off the cows uh, without taking the advantage of being weaned. Uh, on the other hand, in this end of the state, there are more calves that are probably weaned and then grown for some time uh, before they're sold. The difference consists can be quite stark actually in terms of health. And I'll just quickly mention a few things about a study that was done way back in 2003, but it looked at calves that were unknown, unha unknown health history versus calves that have been weaned 45 days and been vaccinated. That's basically the two treatments that we're really interested in with this study that's now, I guess, uh, going on almost 20 years old. One of the things that I want to go to the next slide. One of the things I wanted to point about, out about this, and this is sometimes forgotten, although I think we know what happens when an animal is treated. We think of the antibiotic cost that's that's now on that animal and all, all the other animals in the pen. We know the labor that's involved in treating an animal and so on and so forth. But this, this particular study took these calves from weaning, uh, those calves that were unweaned and unknown health history versus those calves that had been weaned and vaccinated. And there was a dramatic difference uh, between in morbidity, which is sickness, and mortality, which is death loss. One of the things that was also so interested to, interesting to me was when I looked at the calves that had gotten sick versus those, those that, versus those that had stayed well and just looked at performance throughout the entire feeding period. And at the end, those that had been sick, in other words, pulled at least one time and treated with an antibiotic versus those that had remained healthy, at least as far as we know, there was a 0.43 difference in average daily gain uh, across those groups. So it's, it's a big deal. It's a stewardship issue. If I could encourage more of our producers to start their calves at home before they leave, I know we still have an industry that values those unweaned calves, um, but uh, they but tend to be a little bit higher risk once they go to the next place. And so um, I just want to make sure we're all on board with what that looks like in terms of cost and loss of performance. And and other studies have actually looked at carcass value as well. So I don't know if I got another slide in here or not, Mary. I can't quite remember. I think that's it. So anyway, and one more, couple more comments, Zach. The other thing that we're concerned about is not only respiratory disease, not only coccidiosis in the early weaning period, but it also you seem to have cases that show up after weaning of things like pink eye and foot rot. Some of the same things that we dealt with with calves and sometimes cows on pasture. And so that's more of a more of a pull and treat one at a time type things. But usually the environment in the pen, sometimes even the feedstuffs that we're, we're feeding with their, a lot of dust, a lot of holes in the feed, sometimes in really dry, under dry conditions, those dust and particles and, and oat hu uh, hulls can actually get in the, in the eye and cause some pretty serious irritation. Dr. Stucka, what about parasites and controlling for them? Is this a good time of year? Yeah. yeah. So now that we've had pretty good frosts across the state, this is the time when you 
can get rid of internal parasites and don't really have to worry about them again until the cattle go to grass. Um, if you don't, it's interesting. Uh, mature parasites can live in an animal for quite some time. We don't care if there's some. That actually promotes an immune response. So it's not like we want to get rid of all parasites, internal or externals. It's okay to have some, but this would be the time of the year when you can, especially on the calves, Internal parasites tend to be immunosuppressive. So if you're vaccinating calves, uh, they won't respond as well to a vaccine if they're still carrying internal parasites. Let me make one more comment, because this is perfect timing about externals such as lice. I know that treatment for lice and trying to control lice is done at the most convenient time. And the most convenient time is preg checking when they're running through anyway. So we put on lice control at a time, especially this fall, when it's still pretty nice out. Lice activity diminishes when the weather's nice. Our ability to control lice, both sucking lice and biting lice, especially biting lice, is not very good when we put compounds on that are supposed to control lice. They're not very effective when we put, put them on in warm weather. So we all, well, I, I predict we'll have calls later on in the winter that my lice control didn't work. And it's usually because we applied it too early. I use the statement, don't apply lice control until you see the whites of their eyes. Not the whites of the cow's eyes, but the whites of the lice's eyes. So don't treat until you know you've got them and you'll be more successful. You won't get rid of all of them. There are some animals that carry more lice than others. I've also suggested only treat the, the, the uh, cows that have the most lice. It sounds somewhat counterintuitive, but at the same time, I don't want to overuse some of the compounds that we have to control lice because I don't know that we'll have too many more coming down the, uh, the pipeline, so to speak. Thank you, Jerry. I just have to ask, for this internal parasite issue, we've had a drought this past year. Would you expect internal parasites to be lower because of the drought? Or uh, is that something we should test for or just do? No. What is your thoughts? You could. It's it's always hard to interpret a, an egg fecal egg count because they're more than likely going to be there. And in a drought year, it's probably worse actually because cattle tend to graze closer to the ground. Um, so yeah, it may actually be worse this year. And even in cows, especially younger cows, I may be a little bit different. I don't necessarily recommend uh, deworming adult cows. Again, it's a little bit of a stewardship of a product issue. But younger cows, those first calvers, maybe even second calvers, and certainly the calves, it's a good idea to do something this fall with those, those girls. And it always depends on stocking rate. You know, how close are those cows grazing together? What's their chances of picking up internal parasites? Um, so that's usually my recommendation in doing things like that. So if you want to save on feed costs, be sure we just feed the animal and not the internal parasites. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's exactly right. And the, the, the thing that we sometimes forget about internal parasites, especially on grass situations, is that they actually suppress the appetite of animals. That's why they don't gain as well. So it's an interesting phenomenon. Thank you. Appreciate it. Now, ask Zach. Um, uh, we've been thinking about weaning calves and limited, re re limited resources now. So what should producers focus on for doing backgrounding rations for their calves? Yeah, Dr. Stucka alluded to some, some programs in place, the preconditioning. And so for those, you know, either, you know, looking to wean those calves, but don't want to get rid of them just quite yet, or, or if you already have a preconditioning program or some type of backgrounding, I think you want to look at these things as uh, um, two stages. In my mind, there's the starter and then there's the grower. And the starter is really mm -hmm. just important in terms of getting animals on to feed quickly. You're going to be removing one of the, I would say, major resources to them. You know, calves start to graze pretty late into the grazing season. They start, that becomes more of their diet. But milk is still an important contribution. And so you have to be mindful, of course, always of water and checking to make sure your water tanks are clean and cleaning them frequently. 
And so once you get past that, then we can assume water intake is normal. We can get into feed. And so, because if we limit water in any potential way, we're gonna limit feed intake. And if we're, and it's critically important, we talk about the health of a calf. There's a lot of nutrition that ties into the health of that calf and maintaining that health. And so if we, when we look at bringing those calves into an environment where we're now providing the feed to them, the energy, the protein, it has to be just that. So we, we want to look at a diet that's providing on a dry matter basis, somewhere between 14 to 16% protein and has a, a if you're in the TDN realm, uh, around 70% TDN. So it's a high energy diet relative to what the cows are getting or what we're used to providing to those cows. And like I said, the importance there in that starter is intake. Um, your goal should be within that first two weeks, those calves should be on a, a 1.5% of their body weight on intake. And so not only do we want to focus on intake, but uniformity of those bites. And so processing those feeds, having feeds of similar um, particle size together. So uh, it's, it's of course, okay to provide some long stem hay if that's something, but you need to ensure that they're not filling up on that and that you're actually providing some of those concentrates. And we can get around worrying too much about starch with some of those feeds you mentioned, Carl, mm -hmm. in terms of those higher fiber feeds and, and distillers grains is a great way to incorporate protein and energy through that fiber uh, amongst uh, many other resources uh, available. And so you have to look at it as that first two weeks, you need to really focus on intake at that point. And then from that point on uh, in that growing diet, you can kind of um, step it uh, kind of back to what you have available for resources, still maintaining high protein levels at that, at least at that 14% and high energy. But uh, it's critical that you focus up front there. And then once those calves are going, uh, it's a little bit easier ride, a little bit less management throughout that preconditioning phase in terms of nutrition. So I've always noticed that sometimes calves turn up their nose at some of the feeds in the feed bunk that we think is succulent and good and, yeah. and just got to appreciate one thing that throws them in mind is like distiller's grains or, or even field peas or corn silage. Mm -hmm. What can we do to get calves to want to accept those rather than kind of debate on whether they should eat it for three days before they give in? I'm glad you brought that up. So if we think about the start, if we think about that first two weeks being, if we call it, you know, that really important time where we need to get calves on intake, uh, up on intake at that one and a half, get approaching 2% of their body weight, those fermented feeds and some of those more potent uh, feed ingredients might, uh, you might want to hold off on those, especially the ensiled ones. They tend to not promote intake as much due to that palatability. Like I said, once you get through those first couple of weeks, um, if, if you have a lot of silage available, that's maybe when you want to start incorporating that silage into that diet at higher inclusion levels and working towards that. Silage is a great rat, uh, uh, includer at even higher concentrations uh, because it, it's providing a lot of fiber through the, through the corn plant itself, and then it's bringing mm -hmm. in energy through that, that corn grain. And so it's, it's, you make a great point. You really do want to caution at least initially some of those fermented feeds in that first couple of weeks to promote intake. And then once those calves are, are at that one and a half percent or so, you can start kind of bringing in some of those. So, uh, ensiled feeds. So if you're buying calves and bring them into your feed yard, you really have, that's a challenge to get them to eat out of the feed bunk because you're feeding them things you're not used to. But if you're feeding your own calves and going to wean and background at home, one option I've always seen is to go ahead and feed the cows corn silage or whatever rash feeds it is with the calves before mm -hmm. weaning. So the calves, uh, basically the cows teach the calves this is okay to eat. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah, they come on to feed a lot quicker. But yeah. And anyway. if you're someone to creep feed, uh, look at what right. you're providing there as those calves will be familiar. It's all about creating a familiar situation for those calves because you're creating so much stress that they want to lean back on something they're familiar with. And if you're looking at a creep feed, you already are creep feeding them. Consider what's in there and, and look to uh, use some of those ingredients in your, in your growing and preconditioning diets. Good point. Carl, Carl, can I jump in here just a little bit? One of the other advantages, Carl, of doing just what you said is that you're bringing pastures together. You're commingling calves from different groups. So you're taking the stress out of weaning the entire group all at once and weaning them all at once. Some of the biggest wrecks we have 
are throwing all the calves in the same pen at the same time and having respiratory disease. And it's because they don't know one another. So feeding cows and calves together has two advantages. They get used to the feet and the calves get used to one another. Thank you, Dr. Stucka. Now I have to ask Jana, we've talked a lot about this. Uh, are there any things else we should consider when building rations for weaned calves? I guess just um, what you mentioned about, you know, enticing calves to eat it. I guess I just wanted to add a couple things there. Um, that can be a, a huge challenge, especially if they haven't been exposed to those feeds previously. Um, some tips that I've picked up just talking to producers um, in, in different locations is um, sometimes you can, if you have animals on hand that could serve as a, a training animal, um, maybe a, a steer that you're feeding or some other, you know, an older non-lactating animal, obviously, <laughs> when you're talking about wean calves, that would not be ideal to have in the pen with them. <laughs> but it also helps calm them down um, and avoid, you know, when you hear that clattering and animals jumping over feed bunks, that's not a sound we like to hear. Ooh. They spook really easy. So having maybe a couple trainer animals on hand can be helpful. Um, the other thing that we've done in the past is when we're introducing grain to our wean calves, um, use a little bit, something sweet to kind of entice them to get them up to the bunk, some dried molasses or something that they will readily consume and, um, and recognize that you just need to have a lot of patience. And sometimes this takes a couple weeks to get them up on feed the way that you'd like them to be. Um, Zach, you gave a really good overview, I think, of, of what you need to think about in terms of diet quality and, you know, understanding that forage is limited. Um, I still think that there's opportunities to feed calves um, and get them up to the market weight that, that you're shooting for. Um, you know, Carl, you talked about how even though corn is high priced, it does provide more energy. And so um, we typically think of a backgrounding ration as, you know, somewhere between 50 and 60% roughage and then the, and then the rest concentrate. And we, um, there's definitely research out there that kind of looks more at maybe a 70% concentrate, kind of flip that. Um, and so it's just a matter of making sure those calves are worked up slowly um, and adapted to those feeds over time and, and just getting those nutrients into them. And there's lots of options out there. Um, a TMR is probably the best way to control and monitor intake um, because many times, you know, we'll have a free choice forage situation and the calves will go to the forage much more easily. And then we're trying to force um, a certain amount of grain into them and they're not hungry. And so maybe trying to kind of limit that forage or getting it ground and somehow incorporated in your ration um, or just feeding ground hay and getting that measured out um, rather than giving free choice is, is something to consider. Thank you, Jana. I'd like to ask Zach now, excuse me, um, it, when you're backgrounding calves, different people have different ideas of what average daily gain should be. How slow should we grow calves or how fast should we grow calves? Are there any thoughts with that? Yeah, uh, Jana hit it right on the head, I think, with, uh, 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 thank you for that. Uh, TMR is really what you should be focused on. But average daily gain is, uh, is really in terms of how you're putting your diets together. What are your goals? What's the end, keeping the end in mind? Where, what's your market? If you're looking at cows that are, are thin right now and you'd like to take the calves off right now, but you don't normally wean, start considering doing that. But then um, you're going to be investing some, some resources, some feed, some labor, some, and especially money into all that. Uh, into these calves. So having an end in mind will dictate really what your average daily gain goal will be. Now you can really um, do a lot of things if you're working with whoever uh, uh, is going to be buying your calves, uh, you know, see what, what they ideally would like. And if you're, you know what your markets currently provide you based, based on if you do any preconditioning or not. So you have to take that in consideration as you put a little bit of investment in those calves, you expect to get something back. So keep that in mind and you know your markets better than any of us do. But in terms of average daily gain, you can really play with those levels of concentrate to mm -hmm. get, a, I mean, you can go mm -hmm. from anywhere between one to three pounds in those lightweight calves, but you have to keep in mind there's that, you know, putting a lot of, uh, I'll say fat on early on kind of has some, some effects later in the finishing period. And so you really want to be mindful of who your, your customers are in that sense and, and be mindful of that as you look towards putting. And it's really comes down to 
um, economics and, and what, what you want to sell them at when you want to sell them at and work your way backwards to where you are now for gains. But sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. Great question. Well, and, and I, I think that's going to do it for us here. Um, thank you all for joining us today and thank you all, uh, all the panelists, um, for sharing your thoughts. And so today was great. So this is the last of our webinars for the navigating drought series. So we appreciate, uh, thank you for joining us. And of course, um, this will be recorded and available to watch later on. And please feel free to reach out at any time for further questions um, to your local NDSU Extension agent, uh, and they'll be happy to get you the resources that you need. Thank you. Thank you.